Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 100. Show for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Amen. Amen. Lord, you are present here in this sanctuary with arms wide open to welcome each of us to this service. With reverent and peaceful hearts, we gather to worship and praise you. We have a few announcements. The uh, announcement for the Grub Hub again for the Salvation Army. And that's Mondays and Wednesdays. Do you actually make them up or do you hand them out? Does anybody know? Okay, thank you. Wednesdays is just better. Um, Bible studies are on hold until the fall. If you have any pastoral concerns, please contact myself or Nancy Matches. Oh, don't forget to save the stamps. Book and Puzzle Sale Saturday, August 24th at Freeland Parking Lot, sponsored by St. Paul's Presbyterian Church, adults and children's books. I haven't seen that one before. Beef on a bun. Oh, that sounds okay. Take out Friday, September the 6th at St. Paul's Presbyterian Church. $20 for adults. Children 10 and under, $10. Tickets available for church members or Josie Fashions um, you know, on uh, Perfect Street. Got any more hiding in there? Nope? Okay. I have one more. Yeah, I'm just going to leave my pocket. Yep. Okay, the uh, bazaar and, uh, well, I guess it really wasn't a bazaar, it was a bake sale, wasn't it? A bake sale. The barbecue brought in $224. The bake table brought in $832.70. The crafts brought in $266.75 for a total of $1,323.45. Congratulations to the Women's Auxiliary, um, and I think they deserve a round of applause. What do you think? That's page one done. I've got 17 pages, so here we go. This time I would like to lead you in a prayer of invocation. For those who are visiting with us, I stop part with you there for a time of silent personal prayer. Shall we pray? Lord, your mighty power is here with us today. Your wonderful, marvelous, matchless grace is extended to all of us. Your love unbounded, your peace sublime, fill these longing hearts, souls, and minds of your saints gathered here this morning. With grateful hearts and voice, we sing and praise your grace that is greater than all of our sins. The joy, the absolute joy of being redeemed, being washed clean through the blood of Jesus our Savior. Salvation is ours, freely flowing from your throne of peace and covering us and giving us divine comfort that only you can give. Prayers we send heavenward, some silently from, from anguish or grateful hearts. Prayers that we corporately offer up to your throne. Quick short prayer saying thank you for a thought or a message that you may hear or that have touched your heart. Hear us now in silent personal prayer. Mercy came down, and glory filled our souls. Your glory, so encouraging, so benevolent, so encompassing, Father blessed his service, made a message, who are you, resonate with some, in some way with each and every one of us, giving us a challenge, but also a joy to know that you are calling, that you are leading, that you are our Lord and Master, whom you called us to worship and humbly praise your reverent name. 
Lord, we hold you in high esteem. We have been raised, we, have, we raise our grateful prayers, knowing your complete love for each and every one of us. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our first song this morning is Surely the Presence. Number 219, we ask you to stand as you are able. so I didn't wake you up. This time I will offer a prayer for the offering which has been collected. With thanksgiving we praise you, O oh God, for involved, being involved in every part of our lives. You give us health, you give us homes, you give us family and friends, you give us money to live on. We thank you for our health, homes, family and finances and give this offering as a small token to the unbounded gifts that you lavish us with. We pray for the use of this money for your kingdom work, both here and abroad. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Responsive reading is Psalm number 139, verses 11 through 16, and it's in your bulletins and it's also on the overhead. I would like to lead you in that at this time. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and light become night around me, for you created my inmost being. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Amen. Stand up and bless the Lord, number 65. We ask you once again to stand as we sing.
start off with a few questions first. Are you a positive person or a negative person or somewhere in between? Well, do you like people or not really? Do you, are you grumbling? Do you complain? Do you gossip? Speak against others? Judging and muttering under your breath? These are all things contrary to God's word and are not the fruits of the Spirit. Somehow these small things slip under the radar and are not considered sins, or at least we do not see them as big sins. But these very things can clog your spiritual perception and worship. Therefore, I challenge you to a fast from negativity. For the next three weeks, we will start with one week at a time and see how it goes. When you find yourself thinking something negative thoughts, about something or someone, turn it into a prayer. You do not have to agree with a person to bless them. When you catch yourself speaking anything negative, do not just be quiet, step up and bless. We tend to think negative thoughts about ourselves a whole lot, which are not God glorifying. So, when you do pray for forgiveness, in trying to follow this fast, I found it very difficult. And if you are going to do it honestly, you may find so too. The biggest blessing is you will pray more, you will thank God more, you will look at people in a different light, all of which is God glorifying, which is what we are called to do in this life. Shall we pray? Lord God, I ask you to lay the challenge on our heart for those gathered here. Holy Spirit, work in our minds as we seek to worship God, you, God, in this fast. Keep us encouraged when we slip, but in and through this we will learn to be more like Jesus, who told the woman caught in adultery that he too would not condemn her, but encourage her to sin no more. We pray this through the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This time I will invite Nancy to come forward and lead us in the pastoral prayer. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer, please? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You are light, for in you is no darkness. You are absolute moral purity, for you have no moral defect or lack of knowledge. You are holy and worthy of our complete devotion. Although sometimes we feel you are not close, you never lose sight of us. We have the joy of knowing that in our messed up world we need only to look at your instruction manual to find peace, hope, and joy even in the midst of confusion. We need not be anxious by what is happening around us, but can rest in you, for you are faithful. We confess that we are often not who we should be and that we do not always represent you well. As Paul said, we don't do what we should do and we do what we shouldn't. Please forgive us. We are thankful for the joy of relationships, for family and friends, and the fellowship we have here in this church. We experience pleasure in the glory of your creation in a beautiful sunrise or a starry night. We acknowledge that we sometimes don't appreciate the freedom we have in Canada. The ability to come together to worship is not an option for many. Thank you for rest, food, shelter, and health. Help us to appreciate what we have where many others are in need. 
Almighty God, we come before you now as a body of believers. We pray for those in power, for your word says, there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. May your will be done in this our land, and may the hearts of both the leaders and the people be changed so that we will desire your will. We not, may not respect laws passed by our, lo our leaders, but we fail to cover them in prayer. Forgive us. We pray for those who are ill, those in hospital and nursing homes. We lift up those who are grieving, who are lonely or discouraged or struggle with addiction. Show us as believers how to be a blessing to them in your name. We thank you for the release of the Canadian and American prisoners from Russia. And we pray for those who are still in captivity in foreign countries. We lift up those nations who are at war, the Ukraine, the Middle East, Palestine, North Africa, and the many other countries. We ask for an end to the destruction war inflicts. And we pray against those aggressors who fan their pride by disregarding human life so that they can achieve godless results. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we pray for the peace of Israel. We continue to ask that you move hearts to release the prisoners, guard their hearts and their minds in captivity. And Father, we ask that you would drive us to our knees and cause our spirits to be filled with the desire to go and reach nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Soften the hearts of unbelievers um, and loved ones, just as you did with Paul, so that we can know we will share eternity with them. Salvation comes from you, Lord. Bless Bob this morning as he shares what you have laid on his heart. Open our ears to hear what you have to say. Your word says our prayers bring you pleasure, Lord, and they are likened to sweet-smelling incense offered up to you. We know that you hear our prayers and already know the desires of our hearts and are blessed. Help us to be a people who bring glory and honor to your name as we continue to grow in faith and our desire to be more like Jesus. Amen. The message that I'm going to be bringing to you today is not what I intended to. When Nancy asked me if I would uh, do a service, I said, yeah, no problem. Uh, I wrote one last December and it was sitting there, so I would just do that. Three weeks ago, I read that sermon over and felt very much in my heart that I could not deliver it because it was not what God wanted me to deliver. So I had to sit there and write another another one, which is what you're going to hear today. So this is uh, not me. God made you change it, so therefore this is God speaking for you. Our Bible reading this morning is Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Another Bible reading that we have is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Who are you? If I was to ask you to come up here and tell us just who you are, what makes you tick? What plan do you have for the rest of your life? And how are you going to accomplish it? What would you say? 
I could go into a long list of things that you could say, but I'm wondering if one of them would be, I am a Christian. If so, then I am speaking to you. If not, bear with me for the next 20 minutes or so. Being a Christian means a follower of Jesus Christ. Are you excited about that like the apostles did in Acts 5 verse 41? The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had counted, they were being counted worthy of suffering the grace, disgrace for the name. I'm not sure about you, but rejoicing because of being disgraced may be hard to swallow with joy. As we interact with our family members, neighbors, and friends, do they know your commitment to Jesus? That you would be happy with negative comments about your walk, showing up in everything that you said and did, that you are a follower of Jesus? Would they say that you are a fanatic? Would we even show this joy or keep it hidden almost as an embarrassment? What type of Christian are you? Who are you? You are a witness standing in a, are you a witness standing on a street corner and preaching? Or are you a, or are you a closet Christian who doesn't show it, who keeps it secret? Or are you somewhere in between? Maybe we should start at looking at just what Jesus did so we will have know just how to follow him. Well, he sure wasn't secret, secret about having his faith and his love for his father. He didn't back down from the scribes and the Pharisees. He would go and pray by himself sometimes for a whole night. Luke 6, 12 says, one of those days Jesus went to the, the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. He taught and told people about the love of God. He was humble. He loved everyone. He had compassion and empathy for the sick. He fed thousands. He never sinned. He healed. And he didn't say, do you know anything about me? So I know whether I should heal you or not. He just healed them because he loved everybody. He had an open relationship with our Father and the Holy Spirit. He got angry with the commerce that took place in his temple, but the buying and selling, defiling his Father's home. The list goes on. The question is, how do we measure up? I know we cannot measure up to a sinless Savior. We can't, but through the love and grace of God, we can be washed clean of our failings and our mess-ups, and thereby be proud to be a Christian. To be Christ follower is one of the best things in the whole world. People are always looking for a good deal. This is the best deal you could ever, ever get, bar none. To know that by the grace of God, we are washed through the blood of the, our, the blood of the cross. By the love of God, we have a new home being built for us in heaven. Hebrews 11:16 says, instead they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God was not ashamed to be called their God, for he prepared a city for them. Would God be ashamed to be called your God? We have the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit living in us and a God who loves us. We have a God who stands beside us and in us 24-7, 365, saying, this is my son. This is my daughter. They are part of my family. We are redeemed and have the promise of resurrection. We have the promise of glorification. We have the promise we will never be left on our own to fight against Satan. Oh, what joy we find in that. What peace, what comfort. Who are you? What does your, look like, your life look like in view of, being, of what being a Christian is? I'm going to get very, very personal here. The last 12 years of my life, I've been a steady downward path. I was living a dream, in a dream world. Betsy and I had our dream home. We had three good children. 
Yes, two were special needs, but they were set up and taken care of financially and support-wise and support for life. We had one grandchild. He was the joy of our lives. But and that, at, that point, at that point, we had two great-grandchildren, a loving church family and good friends. Then cancer came and knocked on the door. After four years of chemo treatments, hours of prayer, Betsy transferred to heavenly glory. Life moved on. The world did not end. A lot of my joy did. Then God put Joe into my life. We looked forward to having a great future, only to be plagued by the gangrene of, of Joe's diabetes. Trips to the doctor and the hospitals was the norm. And then her cancer was diagnosed. And she too passed to heavenly glory two weeks later. I then invested my money to lose it in a fraud scheme, which led to the estrangement of my family, other than my two sons who did not understand. In June last year, I told my family I had nothing left to live for, except to die by the end of the year. To be under the hand of, a, of correction from God is very difficult, but oh, so necessary. I had placed someone above him. My house was my pride and joy. I was going to make more money and never have to worry. Notice it was always I. God was never in any of these decisions. It was I making out the decisions instead of doing them with God. God stepped in and changed me and my outlook. He basically said, I have things for you to do, to do in my kingdom work, so pay attention. He put a fire in me. I was given a choice, forgive and live or get revenge and die. Since then, I've been on a steady track upwards. Have I changed? Yes. And I thank and praise God every day for that change. I ask for more and more of Jesus in me every day. I want true sanctification. God has put a few things in my heart, and this also involves you. Why he has me standing up here this morning, delivering what he strongly put on my heart. Who are you? You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Look at our text. In 2 Corinthians also we hear what is recorded we also hear what is recorded in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You are a temple, and such you are not your own. You belong body and soul to your Savior, Jesus Christ. That is what you are. That is what you became when you became baptized and made Jesus Lord of your life. A Christ follower with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. You are called to be a fanatic. Yes, a fanatic for Jesus. A fanatic for everything that Jesus stands for. There's no halfway point. There's no room for lukewarm. Revelation 3, 15 and 16 says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one, hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. This verse is telling us what to do when Jesus puts a challenge in your path, a job for his kingdom. We are to get on board, to get on fire for Jesus, jump into the program, not saying, well, maybe I could do something. Not sure if I feel well enough. Not sure if I'm strong enough. Don't know if I can commit the time. Or if, or if, or if. There are no ifs. Age is not a factor. If God gives you a project, he will give you the energy and the enthusiasm to do it. If anything, you will probably feel younger. The real danger in spiritual laziness is that we do not want to be stirred up. We want to hear about spiritual retirement from this world. Yet Jesus Christ never encouraged 
the idea of retirement. He says, go and tell my brethren. Evangelism is not an option. It is a must do for every one of us. No excuses are acceptable to God. He said, go and tell the nations. And we say, well, we don't want to leave this country. Well, guess what? God brought the nations to this country. He doesn't give us an out. We are, as a congregation or individually, we have to figure this out sooner as opposed to later. A non-evangelizing church is a powerless church. It is far more costly in terms of human suffering, the loss of souls. Imagine, just imagine, standing at the gates of hell and hearing the damned begging you to go to their father's house to entreat their brothers and sisters to change their ways so they will not go to hell. Can you imagine that? Just think about that for a moment. During revival, hell is plundered and heaven is populated. Without revival, hell is populated, period. When we make it our business, our serious, earnest business, we exalt Jesus and we say we will do all that he asks us to do. Then we are guaranteed success. We are, the, we are to cooperate with the Father. We are working with the Holy Spirit. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us be thankful and take full advantage of each and every day he gives us to his glory and honor. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4 says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness, holiness. This is good and pleasant. God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of Him and of the truth. That is part of what Nancy prayed in her prayer. All authority we have to pray for. Each day should be lived for Jesus. That means prayer, Bible reading, meditation, spreading the good news, helping others, living a life worthy of the death that Jesus died for you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for you, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Every one of your sins put pain in his crucified body. Every time you don't tell his story when you could have, when you don't want, but you don't want to be embarrassed. Didn't pray before eating in public. You know your sins. If you are honest and not gloss them over, as we tend to have a habit of doing, of making ourselves look good, but, well, it's not, it's not that, you know, that's not that bad. It's just a little sin. No, sin is sin, period. There's no little sins. There's no big sins. In God's eye, every sin is a sin. Jesus could not have been more embarrassed, nailed to a tree, naked, Bleeding from being flogged, which was whipped on his back, that was open and bleeding. John 19 says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Having insults hurled at him, slapped in the face. Talk about embarrassment knowing he was the son of God and totally innocent. But, but, knowing he was doing it for you out of love took the embarrassment away. When love took over, when mercy showed itself, when grace covered all of our sins, that is why he came to earth to make you and I righteous in our Father's eyes. Therefore, telling people about Jesus should be an honor, not an embarrassment. Yes, he asked the Father to pass the suffering in the garden, but went willingly. He didn't say, I'm too busy. 
I'm not sure I can do that. Pick somebody else who's better qualified or any excuse we give for not following him and completing his work that he created you to do before the creation of this world. In Christian work, our initiative and our motivations are often simply the result of realizing there is work to be done and we must do it, a lot of times begrudgingly. Yet, that is never the attitude of a spiritually vibrant saint. His or her aim is to achieve the realization of Jesus Christ in every set of circumstances, joyfully doing for God. We cannot be content with a Sunday-only God. He is king of our lives seven days a week. Seven days a week when we wake up, it's incumbent on us to give praise and thanksgiving to God for giving us another day, another opportunity to proclaim his name to those we see. It does not matter how you feel when you wake up. Yes, I have aches and pains, legs that object to walking on the treadmill when I say my morning prayer for 30 odd minutes, sometimes praying quietly, sometimes singing at the top of my voice. But the time you get, by the time you get on your knees beside your bed and pray and praise God with the right attitude, joy will flood your souls. Songs of praise and thanksgiving will fill your mind and voices, giving worship to God and glory to Him for all the benefits He has given us, living in one of the best countries in the world. This feeling will carry you through the day, tell you once again, kneel before you pray and say your night prayers and sleep peacefully. If you don't find time for God, do you for one minute think He will find time for you? The answer is yes. Yes, he will find time for you. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me. I chose you. He's always there for you. There are, there are times when he may test you. He, may, he wants to make sure that you are committed to him. I'll read part of Matthew 12, 5 through 8. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart, lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. If you are not disciplined, and everybody undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Who are you? Only one person can answer that question, and that is you. As you contemplate taking part in the Lord's Supper this morning, remember, what Jesus did for you. This cannot be a one day a month thing. When you get to church and say, oh, oh yeah, it's Lord's Supper. Time to remember Jesus. No, it should be a constant item on your mind every day. You are a joy. Are you a joy or a disappointment to God? God has feelings. He will not take second place to anything or anyone in your life. Don't do as I did. Make him the reason you get up every morning and the joy and the reason for the smile on your face all day. Yet things will happen in your life that may be hard to take and understand. But God said in Romans 8, 28, we know that all things in God work for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If you want to know him better, read your Bible more. If you want to know him better, Pray more. If you're really serious about knowing him better, spend quality time with him, following what is written in the Bible. Ask God to open your eyes and your mind as you read the Bible. Do the, start reading, start praying before you read and ask him to do that. Seek with an open mind a revelation from God about the promises found in the Bible. The Bible is full and full of promises that are for you. Look them up, read them, internalize them, and see the absolute love that God has for you. Knock on heaven's door with your heart, mind, soul, and spirit. Look for what he promised in Acts 2, 17. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. 
God will respond to anybody who reverently and sincerely seeks him. Paul tells us to pray always in all circumstances with thanksgiving and praise to God. You will be blessed if you fervently ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance. All who knock on heaven's door asking are illuminated with God's holy word. Jesus Christ, the Son of God with power and all is, is an all-sufficient Savior, a glorious Redeemer. Wherever he is preached, as Christ crucified and Lord over all, as King, whenever, wherever his authority is supremely acknowledged, wherever he is adored, adored as the sovereign ruler, there we are invited to enter kingdom, his kingdom humbly and reverently, acknowledging his deity. Hebrews 1, 3 says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory an exact representation of his being, sustaining all things in his powerful world, word. So, just who are you? You are God's miracle, a one-off miracle, an heir to his kingdom. You were planned and seen in his vision before you were created. You are his image bearer, his beloved child. So lift your heart, hands in praise, and he will hold your hands and walk down life's road with him by your side, guiding and lighting your way. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. Jesus Christ crucified is our Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. We are the bride of Christ. And through us, healing and delivering blood, the blood, and through us, the, the healing and delivering blood of Jesus should flow to all the nations. So gird up your loins, put on your sandals, grab your staff, because we are headed for the promised land together praising and glorifying our holy God. Amen. Let us pray. Father, where you lead, we will follow. Our lives are lived to bring glory and honor to you. We are not our own. And thank and praise you for the Holy Spirit, for Jesus giving us heavenly peace here on earth. Each morning may we wake up with the knowledge that we are a valuable part of your heavenly creation. Trust in your word, not with our feelings, not only with our feelings, but allow the Holy Spirit to change our self-perception. Praise be to your holy name, and it is in Jesus' name once again that we pray. Amen. Grace is greater than our sins. Number 344, we ask you to stand as we, you are able.
Now, you're, now everybody's awake. Thank you. We give thanks to God the Father. These are the words in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. We give thanks to God the Father, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Before he suffered, gave us his memorial of his sacrifice until he comes again. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. With these words, the Lord commands, commands all believers to eat this broken bread and drink his cup in true faith, in the confident hope of his return in glory. In this supper, God declares to us that our sins have been completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself finished on the cross, one for all. He also declares to us that the Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ, who with his very body is now in heaven, at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. Come therefore, all who are worthy, who are truly sorry for their sins, who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, have confessed his name and desire in obedience to come to him. Come eagerly and joyfully with assurance of faith for Christ our risen Savior and invite you as a guest to fellowship with him at his table. Shall we pray? Father, we give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, for his willing obedience and suffering during his life on earth, especially for his giving up of his body and blood on the cross, giving us assurance that our sins are pardoned through his blood. Let your perfect love, perfect divine love, may your perfect love drive out fear, making us perfect in your love. Fill our minds with your peace and turn our eyes to heaven where Christ is at your right hand, interceding for us. Enable us to offer up ourselves in service to Christ and to all your children. Let no trouble or sorrow distract us from this loving service and unite us with each other through your spirit so that we may continue in loving hope of our Lord, Savior Jesus and his coming. Hear us now through the words of the the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us saying in unison, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. People of God, let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let us lift them up to the God of our salvation. The bread which we break signifies the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Has everybody got their communion cup? Yes? Okay. At this time, let us pray for the bread. It should be on. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer, please? Jesus, it was you who instituted communion. You did this so that as your disciples, we would remember your death and sacrifice. Communion is a proclamation of your death but it is also a celebration. So even though we grieve that our sinful natures are the reason you went to the cross, we are reminded as we partake of the bread that you dwelt among us, that you died for us, and that your Holy Spirit is alive and working in us. This bread represents your body broken at Calvary for us, and we eat it in remembrance and in hope. Take, 
each remember and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for a complete forgiveness of all our sins and be thankful. The cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is a communion of the blood of Christ. Let us pray for the cup. Father, this cup is a representation of our blessed Savior's blood poured out for our sins on the cross, giving us a new covenant that opens heaven's doors to give us unlimited access to you. With deep and heartfelt and humble prayer, we praise and thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit. What grace, what love, what care, what compassion we receive from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Take, drink, remember and believe that the blood of our Lord and Savior was shed for the complete forgiveness of all your sins and be thankful. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all within me. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of our sins and heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from the pit and crowns us with loving kindness and compassion. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and praise. Let us pray. With burning hearts, we thank you, Father, for making Christ known to us in the breaking of bread and at the poured out cup. Now may this meal enable us to increase our faith, preserve in hope, and grow in love. May this witness to Christ's death draw others into the fellowship with him, so that all our children will be gathered in to share with us the joy of our salvation. Send us out from this place by your Spirit, our ears open to your word, our minds alert to the calling you give us, our hearts full of zeal for your coming kingdom, our voices confess in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. The last song is number 231, but the peace of Christ will in your heart. the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you faithful, and he will do it. Amen.